we are all right and welcome to the sophomore stint the second edition the encore of sorts whatever you would like to call it of something we started last week and we're going to keep on going with it how's everybody doing tonight my name is davidson baker i am a staff writer at mmatakeover.com as well as the host of this podcast around the cage it is episode number two and we are very thankful for you joining us tonight uh, this week is no different from last week. We are joined by a, a quartet of an all-star team this week, you know, kind of re rocking and reloading. And uh, here we go nonetheless. Start for starters. My colleague at MMATakeover.com, uh, Brandon Sigby, please do not kill me if I pronounce that last name wrong, my man. How you doing tonight? Good, man. Good. It's a Sibsy, but it was it was close. Sibsy. The, the B's before the C? Yeah. I, I don't know why that like switch that like catches me for a loop, man. I apologize sincerely. No, no. Know. People have known me for years, don't mispronounce it. I don't even correct them anymore. I just roll with it. It's fine. <laughs> um, joining us from the the great region of New England, and obviously relishing in another Tom Brady Super Bowl appearance, I would assume. Of Flow Combat and Tapology, Nolan King. Nolan, how you doing, man? Doing good, man. I'm I'm looking to uh, continue New England's success here on this show. You know, that's all we do is win. So. Uh, let me uh, keep rolling that into this one, huh? <laughs> Confidence very high, and is what we like to hear. And then uh, a, a special <laughs> guest joining us from down under, uh, all the way down in Sydney, Australia, uh, at martial arts connoisseur, as well as former UFC light heavyweight title challenger, uh, Elvis, Sino Elvis Sinocic. And did I say that correctly? Uh, pretty close to the way would it, everyone just says Elvis Sinocic with Pretty much just stuck with that for years now. Okay, well, if if like I said, uh, feel feel free to feel to correct me if I barb any uh, that in any way, shape, or form. And uh, finally, last but not least, uh, from the Great White North, uh, my good friend, a friend of my podcast, the Bottom Line, uh, Fight Night Picks, very own Craig Allen. Craig, how you doing, man? Thanks for having me, man. Uh, minus twenty six degrees Celsius with the wind chill today. It's uh, cold as hell up here. Jesus. Oof. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm lounging in 30 degree heat. Obviously, that's so <laughs> you gotta love it, man. Uh, all areas of the world getting the shine here and uh, talking about the sport we all know and love. And uh, let's get right to it. Just in case those listening this week heard about it from a friend's friend or a cousin's friend or a board or whatever, the rules are pretty simple here. The panelists are rewarded by points, not by whether or not I agree with their arguments, but rather how well they back their original arguments up themselves. Following the fourth question, the unlucky member that is left with the least amount of points, unfortunately, will have to say sayonara, even though we would really love to continue to have them on. However, rules are rules and the show must go on. Uh, the second round is only one question, and once again, um, the person with the least amount of points at that point will be let go as well until we're down to a final showdown where I'll ask a question to the final two that they did not know beforehand. What's up? Magical. Are you guys ready to get rolling? Uh, well, I'm the king of rock and rumble. I'm ready to roll. <laughs> <laughs> Well, without right further ado, the, the topic of discussion, obviously, this weekend, they were in abundance with performances from Henry Cejudo, Donald Cerrone, and uh, some others less to be desired alike. But the big topic of the weekend obviously came from the main event. And after Henry Cejudo finished TJ Dillashaw in the opening round, Mr. Craig Allen, we will start with you. So I'm going to leave this off, which was a bit premature, but my question is, do you, the people want to know, do you, do you agree? Do you think the stoppage was early? Why or why not? The people on Twitter found out awfully quickly how I felt about this one, and they really disagreed with me. Um, I was fine with the stoppage. When you've got a guy moving down from 135 to 125 who's used to having his body in sync, I mean, he's going to have to cut weight to get to 135 anyway. And at the training lab, they do their very best. He had a great friend, a training partner, Juan Archuleta, who was also making the move from 145 to 135. So where Dillashaw has all that backing to do it, his body's still going to be out of sync. And referee Kevin McDonald's been in the UFC since 2011. A little story that's quick. I know I'm on a timer. But at Bellator 209 in Tel Aviv, Israel, uh, McDonald did quite a few different fights on that card. And two days later, I had a chance to speak to him at NEF 36 in uh, Portland, Maine. So, yeah, he's one of the best referees in the business. He knew what he was doing. And uh, it's tough. I mean, you got to keep your champs fresh. Okay. Uh, Elvis, your, your response. 
Yep. Look, I, I don't think it's really a black and white uh, question. Uh, there's shades of grey. Was it a bad stoppage? No. Could have been let uh, go longer? Absolutely. Um, I think being a title fight that the, the, the champion and the challenger, and considering they're both champions, should get a little bit more leeway than uh, your regular fights. I mean, you have a look at what happened with Whitaker and Romero. Whitaker was uh, gone for all intentions and purposes, yet managed to come back and, and win a dominant decision uh, in the end. Um, he was... He was definitely hurt. You can't deny it. So from that perspective, it wasn't a bad stoppage. But for a championship fight, I think it could have been allowed to go a little bit longer. All right. Good point, Sarah. Brandon? Yeah, no, I think it was it was a fine stoppage. I agree with Elvis. It could have went on a few seconds longer, but that's just delaying the inevitable. Um, he... TJ ate 12 to 15 unanswered shots in a row. Even though they were fast, it happened. Um, he was grabbing the leg. He wasn't really defending himself. That's just an instinct move at that point. He's not dodging a weave, and he's not landing his own shots. And it's the ref's job to make sure the fighters are intelligibly defending themselves. You know, and, and he really wasn't. Um, plus, he had that severe weight cut a day before. He's still rehydrating from that. That's not good for the brain to be eating all those shots. Um, no, I can, I'm fine with the stoppage. They could have let him go unconscious, but Ten what seconds. would that have solved, really? I mean, I'm fine with it all. Good point there as well, Nolan. Yeah, I, I don't think it was an early stoppage either. I mean, I, I almost look at stoppages when people say, oh, is it an early stoppage? Was it a late stoppage? I guess what they're looking for is a perfect stoppage, and I feel like that that's not a good way to judge this whole thing. I think you, like Elvis said, it has to be a gray gray area. It has to be a range almost. So was this on the earlier side of an acceptable stoppage You know, of the range? Yes, it was on the earlier side of an acceptable stoppage in the range. Uh, but, you know, the, the only really the only thing that you could go off of here, if, if you really wanted to argue, would be, uh, the fact that this was a title fight, they should be have more leeway. I guess Kevin McDonald's answer to that would be, you know, where does it say that in the rules, that type of an ordeal. So I, I think it was a good stoppage. Uh, it was on the earlier Ten side seconds. of being a good stoppage, though. Okay. Quality responses there. Through question number one, uh, how about sevens across the board? Sevens across the board, all knotted up through one and uh, heading into number two. And uh, the narrative, obviously... That has to do with question number one, ties directly into number two with no UFC on the calendar this weekend. Got a pretty big event up in the forum, which we will get to. However, one has to imagine what the stakes will be down in Fortaleza next weekend as Rafael Sunsau and Marlon Moraes run it back. Elvis, I'll begin with you. And what I want to know is, despite the emphatic fashion that Henry Cejudo put TJ Dillashaw away in, should the winner of that fight in the right weight class that TJ Dillashaw normally resides in, being the winner of the Sun Sal Marais, should the winner of that fight be the true rightful man for Dillashaw next before Cejudo gets a second crack? Let's look, it's, a, it's an interesting situation. The champion now has a loss on his record. Even though it's a different weight class, should he have to defend that loss at his weight class before he takes in any other challenges? And I guess that's the question you really need to answer. My opinion is, I like these super fights. They're good to fit in, but I don't want to do it at the behest of the division. And if you allow Cejudo to come up and get the next shot, you're holding back to the, both divisions again. I think that the rightful challenger should come up and take their shot. If TJ is still holding the belt, then Cejudo should get his shot at Ten him seconds. again. Uh, if not, uh, then give Cejudo the shot at whoever is the uh, bantamweight champion. Nolan. Yeah, I, I'm, I think that the Asan Cal Marais rematch should be the number one contender fight. I mean, I think super fights are a little bit overused right now. This is a tricky situation just in the fact that, you know, we just had this fight with Dillashaw and Cejudo. There was controversy. Cejudo was the one that won. He should go be able to go into Dillashaw's backyard and, and get his revenge. But I kind of like the idea of being able to build these things a little bit. Uh, the UFC has a tendency now to, to rush right into rematches and not build them up. So when you when you have two divisions that you have contenders in, you have Joseph Benavides at 125, you have Asan Kamamaraes, the winner of that, at 135. I see no reason to, to do this fight right now. You know, Build it up a little bit. Have, have it in the back of people's minds. Get people excited for it, uh, especially when you have two deserving contenders like Asan Kamamaraes at, at 135 that have done more than enough for a shot. I think that that fight should be the number one contender fight. 
right, Brandon. All right, uh, yeah, I disagree with that a bit. I think UFC should actually strike while the iron's hot on Cejudo. In the past five months, he's beaten Mighty Mouse and TJ. Well, beat Mighty Mouse, depending on who you ask, of course. Um, and ESPN Plus had over 500,000 people subscribe this week. And a lot of these people, I feel, were more casual fans. I think they need to do this rematch soon. I know that sucks for Asan Sal and Morais, who both, whoever wins definitely deserves the title shot. But there's a chance one of those guys beat TJ, and that kills off this rematch completely. You know what I mean? Down the Ten road, seconds. it'd be a long time. So, yeah, I think they strike while they're inside. I think they um, draw in these casual fans again who would buy this pay-per-view, I think, to see this. A lot of them, at least. You know, a majority of them. Good stuff, guys. Craig, go ahead. Mar- Marais had the great finishes over Rivera and in uh, his last fight. You know, his last two fights have gone great. But a has beaten Marais. A has beaten Dillashaw. Wouldn't it be cool if a Sunsau fought Cejudo? It won't happen, but still, we'll leave it there. <laughs> I don't think that the fight should happen between Dillashaw and Cejudo. I mean, Stipe didn't get a shot directly for Daniel Cormier's belt. And yeah, we see it every now and again, a rematch between two champs. But I just, I don't see it here. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense. I mean, height for height and size for size, Dillashaw and Cejudo match up well. But a and Marais are really hot as well at 135. And it makes a lot of sense to keep those divisions moving. Okay. Good responses there as well. Coming in after... Uh... Come, coming in after that round, we have uh, Elvis with 15, uh, Craig and Nolan with 14, and Brandon with 13. Not too far off the pace, but uh, keeping it competitive going into three and four. And while we will not completely shy away from the festivities in Brooklyn just yet, uh, you got to touch on a quite a big fight card this week and what it could mean as the forum is hosting once again. It's Another big MMA event like they did at the end of last month with UFC 232. Bellator 214 takes place in Inglewood this weekend. And Ryan Bader obviously is in that main event slot against Fyodor Emelianenko for the Bellator Heavyweight Grand Prix title. So, Craig, I will go ahead and start with you. Obviously, the white elephant, the, the elephant in the room for you know everyone at least at 205 is when is Ryan Bader going to return and defend that belt? We think Vadim Nemkov is probably the guy that's next for him, but should Ryan Bader win and become the Bellator champ champ this weekend and be the first to do so? What are the chances he goes back to 205 in his next fight to fight the rightful number one contender Vadim Nemkov? I don't think they're all that great. Um, You know, considering where he is age-wise, I know he could keep doing it. Bellator, as far as the light heavyweight and heavyweight division, heavyweight's probably got more talent than the light heavyweight division. And you look at Nemkov, a guy who's beaten Felipe Linz, who's your heavyweight champ in PFL, Liam McGarry, former champ, and Phil Davis, Davis out of Alliance MMA. A really, really great test. I mean, Vadim Nemkov coming out of uh, Team Fedor, He's looking like a world beater. So why would you take that? Why don't you take maybe some easier fights at heavyweight? Keep building your resume, and you're you're the champ champ now. I mean, it, it's a great accomplishment for him if he's able to beat Fedor. Stick around at heavyweight. Nolan. Yeah, I, I think that it's a, there's pretty low probability that this fight's going to happen next. Uh, just knowing Bellator and the way that they build their prospects, I feel like we have to uh, see like. For most of the prospects that they've had, it's taken them a while to get that major fight. I mean, how many times did Michael Venom Page have to fight somebody at the same skill level before he got the next step up? You know, uh, there's been a ton of examples of that. And I think Nemkov's a guy that while he's had impressive wins, maybe to us diehards, he hasn't necessarily uh, outside of the Liam McGeary fight hasn't been exposed to the uh you know to the, the the rest of the mma world to the point where everybody's calling for him to get a shot i saw ryan bader uh, earlier today or, or recently said that uh, uh within the last few days said that maybe he wants to fight machida at 205 next if I'm musasi sorry. and carva uh lovato jr are tied up at 185 still i could see bellator going that route that seems like it's more up to speed with what they're looking for uh so i don't think that that fights uh has a very high probability of happening next brandon yeah, no, I don't think it happens next. Um, I think Bader maybe takes a little break after all this. Uh, he might, it, should he win, he might try to defend his heavyweight title. But I don't think he sticks around at heavyweight for good. Um, I think guys like Minakov and Congo with that size difference, uh, Minakov's grappling, I think. I mean, Bader's not a huge heavyweight. He's like 225, 230-ish. Um, I mean, he's won a heavyweight tournament, but it was full of middleweights and light heavyweights. Uh, I think eventually he goes back down to avenge that loss 
possibly Demachita if he goes up to 205. I think maybe Musasi, if he beats Lovato, he goes for the champ champ at 205 against Bader. Those are all big fights and interesting fights. I think it'll be a while before we see Nemkov versus Bader, though. And Elvis. Well, it's going to be difficult to disagree with everyone. Uh, Nemkov, obviously, is a high-risk, low-reward fight. Like, the guy is super talented, very dangerous, uh, and he risks losing that belt, but not a lot of reward if he wins. It's not going to, obviously, make him as much money. It's not going to create the fame. Um, it's really coming into that super fight era. And uh, as mentioned previously, fights with like Lyoto Masasi, the big names, I think that's what Beta will be looking for. Um, if Nef- Nemkov continues to, you know, make a big name and expand, he may take him on before he retires. But I think after this fight, if he beats Beta, look for uh, Beta be- to be looking for the biggest money fights out there. Okay. All right. Once again, fantastic response for you guys. You guys making this tough on me just like last week. La- I mean, last week it was really close and really down to the wire all week long. Right now it is Nolan currently in the in the driver's seat with 21, Craig and Elvis with 20, and Brandon still right behind him with 19 right off the pace. So a solid answer right here in this round will determine who will go home first. Dun, dun, dun. However, here we are. Fans were critical of Greg Hardy in multiple facets following his disqualification for an illegal knee on Saturday night. Look, I know a lot of people would not be super stoked to have Greg Hardy um, uh, on the itinerary of list of things to talk about, but he was in a co-main event slot for a reason. Whether it's to his fighting ability or not, that's to your better judgment and not my call to make. However, Brandon, I'll start with you. When Greg Hardy returns to the drawing board down at a Coconut Creek with ATT and everybody... They've laid down the blueprint. What's the very first step him and his team take in improving his ability as a fighter? I mean, he's obviously really green. He's had four professional fights now. He obviously wasn't ready for the coming events spot. Um, besides stuff like his wrestling defense, his striking defense, you know, I'm not a uh, coach or anything. I think the big thing he needs to really work on is that getting that experience before getting thrust into this again. Because his mental game seemed off. He seemed plus, um, frustrated when he couldn't put Crowder out as easily as he put everybody else out. He seemed frustrated when Crowder was in his face talking trash. I don't think that caused him to throw the knee. Like, some people were saying it did. Some people were saying he was looking for a way out. But I think it fogged his brain up enough to where he wasn't thinking right when he threw the knee. I think he was a little pissed off in there. And I think he was just unsure what to do. And As an unexperienced guy, people say, you know... He's used to the big show because he's from the NFL. Well, this fight and football aren't the same thing. This is a different ball game now. So I think he just needs to go back to the island fights or um, ESPN Plus prelims, honestly, and get that experience in and get his head cleared. Elvis. Look, I mean, as mentioned, there's a lot of reasons uh, he probably shouldn't have been in there um, with history, his fight experience and that. But he was um, in the end. Um, as you saw, as mentioned, that may... Was it intentionally thrown knowing it was illegal? I, I don't know, but it was definitely thrown under frustration. As mentioned, he just uh, didn't know what he was doing. He just kind of pulled it under the pressure. He'd lost the first round. Uh, he landed big shots, but they weren't finishing his opponent. Um, I think what he needs to do is probably uh, go have a look at what Yoel does. Yoel was an extremely exclusive athlete, has the ability to pace himself. You could say work on cardio. But guys with a lot of muscle mass, it's difficult to work on cardio. What it comes down to is energy conservation, which will allow him to think a little bit clearer while he's out there. All right, good, good points, good points. Craig? Yeah, it definitely seemed like he kind of got lost in the moment a little bit. I mean, even in his intro, it was really showy. You could tell he was kind of green, like it was mentioned before. And then when he was in there and he was really, really trying to land those shots, he didn't have time to work in his previous fights. In the three amateur and three pro fights, he could afford to be a little bit wild. But out there against Crowder, Crowder's movement kind of negated that. And he did look wild and he did look frustrated. So if you're going to go back, maybe have the rule book on uh, audio book. Play that while you're goofing around doing whatever you like to do and try and learn those rules and get set up uh, for your next time. But as was mentioned as well, I mean, cardio is definitely going to be an issue. And maybe the prelims or or island fights or smaller organization where that developmental deal can kind of shine, that might be a good spot for him. Mr. King. 
Yeah, uh, being the fourth one to go here, I mean, I'm going to repeat a lot of what people said, but composure is the word that sticks out to me here. I mean, you saw it from the start. I mean, this is the first time uh, since Greg Hardy's first amateur fight that, you know, he's punched an opponent and and actually been hit back afterwards. I mean, that must just be a a totally different mindset for him than what he's used to. So, uh, you know, he's got to go back. He's got to watch the tape. He's going to he's going to see what he did wrong in situations where. The guy uh, Crowder was giving him pressure back. I mean, he just seemed frustrated, rushed, sloppy, uh, all of the above when, uh, you know, after that in- initial opening burst. So uh, and obviously, you know, I think that that led to the the knee, whether it was out of anger, or whether it was just out of general, uh, you know, frustration or, or uh, you know, just a lack of composure. I think that uh, that knee kind of summed up what he was lacking in that whole fight, which was just the ability to, uh, you know, to, to stay level-headed and and understand what you, he had to do t- in order to adjust to win. Great answers once again, guys. Um, man, you guys don't make it easy on me. Uh, but however, the show does carry a narrative, and and it uh, you know it must go on. Elvis and Nolan sit atop it with twenty nine. Craig right behind him at twenty eight, and Brandon just one point off the pace, my friend. 27. Unfortunately, we have to say goodbye. All right. All right. Well, thanks for having me, guys. <laughs> nice to talk to everybody. Hey, man. And, uh, being one point, being one point off the pace, just like last week. Well, at every single round, there was an elimination. Everybody was one point off. There are great answers given by everybody, and uh, I'm sure that you'll be back on for sure, my guy. Well, yeah, yeah. Thanks, guys. Yep. Uh, Take care. The awkward part about it is I don't know how to take people off the call. And, uh, yep, he took care of the form. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> so we are down to three. And uh, as I stated before, Nolan and Elvis at the top of 29, Craig with 28. A stellar round for this one right here. Could keep the streak going for Canada. Being that Canada is the only one on the board as uh, the, the great James Lynch took home the inaugural title last week. So no pressure. No pressure. <laughs> Not feeling it. So rapid fire going ahead with these three guys right here. Same same rule set applies, 45 seconds just about. And uh, here we go. So once again, we jump back into Bellator 214 with the card coming up this weekend. Um, and especially in comparison with last year, Bellator 192 being the start of the year show uh, that featured, you know, the war with Lima and McDonald and um, the, the start of this tournament. We kind of get it now to come full center. However, there's been a little bit of criticism amongst fans on the call on the quality of this weekend's card in Inglewood, uh, especially with a pair of featherweights that aren't really well known at five and six records and seven and five records kicking off this make card. Nolan, we'll start with you. Did Bellator drop the ball on putting this card together? No, I don't, I don't think so. I mean, especially when you factor in the fact the fact that their co-main event was canceled for this fight, they were supposed to have uh, you know Musasi and Lovato fight. Uh, the main reason that those uh, featherweights are on the card is that one of them, Adele El Tamini, uh, I'm not sure if you guys remembered, uh, if, if you guys watched the uh, the Salute the Troops card, but uh, he was a fighter that they signed as part of the, uh, like, you know, in, in, in uh, honor of the troops and everything. He's a, a war veteran. So I think that, uh, you know, maybe that fight would have ended up on the prelims had Musasi not got canceled. But I think that's the main reason this fight's on there. And then you got Ricky Bandejas versus Juan Archuleta, which is a phenomenal fight. Uh, you've got a crossover fight with Jack Swagger coming into to Bellator, which people can have their complaints, but it, it's something that Bellator does well. And then Pico versus Corrales that's and like Fedor it. versus Bader. Those fights sell themselves. I think that's a great one to punch that, uh, you know, no matter what, they have Fedor at the top. The, the rest of the card's really good, too. I, I think it's uh, I think it's a good card, man. I don't think they drop the ball. Correct. I got to come back here. So it's a paramount card. As long as the main card's good, everybody's happy. And that's kind of what we have here. Nolan brought up a good point. El Tamini, uh, the fact that they signed him off to salute the troops. His last fight was in King of the Cage against Juan Archuleta. It was a loss, but he's looking to get back to his winning ways. And like you said, I mean, the co-main was supposed to be another championship fight. And one of the things that Bellator will do, and we saw it recently, they booked an 0-11 fighter. She was billed as 0-12 on some sites to fight a 2-1 fighter. So yeah, every now and again, matchmaking is a little suspect and you have to kind of wonder about it. But here, as far as the main card being good on Big Paramount, where they draw all their ratings, I'm fine with it. And Elvis? Well, it's going to be a similar situation coming last. Uh, they've covered all the, the good points. No, I don't think they dropped the ball. It's pretty much how most of the cards work. They start with their lesser fighters. 
But uh, the flip side is a lot of times they're the more exciting fights and it's a great way to get the ball rolling. It's not unlike what the UFC is doing with their next card where they've got with us Whitaker, Silver and Adesanya at the top of the card and the undercard is more filler leading to the main event. And that's what it's all about. It's all about this heavyweight title fight. Plus you've got Pico in there. But it's all about building, getting to the main event, and it's going to do its job. Everyone's going to tune in to see that. All right. Great answers again from you guys. Uh, 37 for Nolan, 36 for Elvis, and uh, Mr. Allen with 35. Uh, I, I, I feel, I feel, uh, I feel like it's a very difficult thing for me to do all these scores when you guys' answers are so good. Everybody's losing by one point every single time. Every single time. However, uh, nonetheless, so Craig. The quality of the guests are getting in. That's what I'm saying, man. That's what, this week and last week. Uh, but nevertheless, Craig, uh, my friend, um, that is it. Well, it's been uh, a good one. And, uh, yeah, hopefully you guys stay warm. Hey man, you too. I'm, I'm definitely warm here. <laughs> yeah, you Have too. a good week, guys. You take care, man. All right. So it is New England without the help of Bill Belichick this time. Versus the Aussies in our final showdown. So once again, our final showdown works basically just like the rest of the show does, except these guys do not know the question that I'm going to be asking right here. And to be honest with you, it's a question I improvised kind of on earlier today with a new topic kind of surmounting. So are you guys ready? I think so. As ready as I'm going to be. All I'm right. I'm going to roll like I did when I was fighting. <laughs> All right, let's do it. So there was a leak today kind of came out. I think the, um, the initial report was made by the good guys and uh, our good friends over at Combache. Rafa Marino, uh, I believe, was the one to get this scoop. First, the news came out that the third UFC on ESPN card would be the UFC's return to Miami. Then we learn quite after that, or shortly after that, rather, that the main event is going to be Yoel Romero and Paulo Costa, which sets up the first three main events on linear ESPN now in the fourth lore. We have Velasquez and Nganu, Gaethje and Barboza, and Romero and Costa. Nolan, I will start with you. Is there anything to take away from the UFC and the ESPN announcing their headliners for the linear cards way ahead of schedule in comparison to some other ones? Yeah, I mean, I, I love it personally. I think that, uh, you know, it, it, the, the big ESPN cards, there's going to be more of them this year, but it has that big Fox card feeling. It's, it's, it's a fight night card that's a little bit, the main event's a little bit better than maybe, you, you know, your average FS1 or ESPN Plus uh, card. Uh, and I also think that it means that they're planning appropriately. We saw the UFC last year uh, scramble with some of these main events. Tickets were on sale for weeks and they still hadn't announced what the main event was. They pushed the ticket sale date back. Uh, it became this became this big conundrum. So it shows that they actually really care about these cards. They're trying to really craft them for a, for a, a national audience to get people to watch, uh, and, and they're planning, uh, you know, accordingly to, to be able to do that. And Elvis, I have a slightly different take on it. I, I think it probably has more to do with the professionalism of ESPN and dealing with big sports. They're not going to like having. Uh, main events announced at the last minute. They want to have their cards advertised in advance. They want the fans to know uh, what's coming up. They want their fans to be ready to tune in. And I have no doubt that uh, this is in their contract that they've got to get these fights booked in advance. Um, they obviously want the most exciting fights that are not title fights. And, and these fights that have come up, every single one of them are fan favorite fights. And, um, and again, I, I just think it's ESPN. They put the foot down. They're very professional. They know how to run big sports organization uh, shows. Um, that's what it is. And I think we're going to continue to see that. And we're going to see uh, ESPN help lift uh, UFC and the MMA. I think it's a fantastic thing. All right. So before I go ahead and announce this week's winner, uh, I would like to thank both of you 
for being the final two men standing. You guys both did a phenomenal job. Thank Thank you for having us on here. I really appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely, guys. Absolutely, guys. And uh, Craig and Brandon as well, they both did a fantastic job. However, uh, we're staying on the international side for the trophy winner, Mr. Elvis. (laughs) You are our winner for the week. Bringing it down from down under. Bring it up from down under. <laughs> and, and, and I'll be honest with you, as far as points are concerned, it was dead even, too. It was uh, really just a matter of a tiebreaker of where I would go at the edge. And, um, you know, I think the programming stick kind of might have given the uh, the edge to Elvis there. However, Nolan, you know, um, not not any bad response there on your part whatsoever. But uh, maybe maybe call Bill Belichick, see if he can uh, get you a little yeah, more yeah. <laughs> I think I think my main issue. I think I jinxed myself saying that cocky spiel at the beginning. I, I, I was trying to I was trying to fill Keith fill Keith Schilling's shoes since he wasn't here. And look at we both walked away with fat L's. So uh, I couldn't have lost to a better guy. It's it's not a bad thing to lose to a, a former UFC title uh, challenger. So I can't complain. And uh, I thank you for having me on. And uh, this was great. I'll have to do it again sometime if you'll have me. Yeah, man. We would love to have both of you guys back again, Elvis. Now that you've won. Uh, you actually have the floor for uh, for 30 or so seconds to uh, talk about whatever you would like in the sport. Uh, the floor is yours. Go ahead. Look, uh, again, thank you very much to uh, all my uh, competitors. They did a fantastic job. I mean, the insights were uh, great. Uh, it's one of the things I love doing. I love talking about the sport of MMA. Uh, you'll find me on Twitter. So if you want to have a chat, jump on, look, look up Elvis Cinetic. Um, I'm always discussing the pros, the cons. I'm, I'm always happy to, to say it the way I see it. So hopefully I'll see more of you guys out there. Thank you for having me on. Yeah, um, again, this is what I love, what I do. I run the Kings Academy here in Australia. I'm on Fox Sports still. We're still, uh, even though ESPN has taken the flight night, we're still doing the pay-per-views. So I'll still be involved in that side. Um, working with, uh, last night we had Jesse just out at the gym doing a seminar. So sweet, love the, love the fans. Um, and yeah, I look forward to coming back on and defending uh, the title down under. Yeah, man, I might have to get a uh, kind of like a tournament of champions going at some point. Your uh, your name is on that list, so uh, we'll uh, we'll have to certainly look to get you included. So uh, thank you for those listening to this. And uh, just so you guys know, in case you are not aware, this is available just about anywhere a podcast can be listened to on the Loudmouth Podcast Network. Until next week, uh, we say so long, and thank you very much for listening. Uh, until next time.